My sermon passage is Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 to 58. The Rejection of Jesus at Nazareth. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there, and coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Who does this story about Jesus remind you of? Surely it makes you think of someone. Have you ever been to a class reunion? If you have, and it was a small town or a particularly close-knit class, you've probably seen and heard versions of this kind of thing. Or even if you were part of a subgroup that hung out together, were you a band geek or a football boy or a basketball girl or a jock in general or a Votech kid, an ag kid, FFA kid, college prep, science nerd? We all had our groups. Well, you probably saw or heard or said or someone said about you at a reunion. Look at him, walking in here like he owns the place, wearing that outfit. Look at those shoes, or in my case, boots. And did you see what he drove up in? There are other ways to get a crowd's negative attention, and those are stereotypes. But stereotypes were types first. There's some truth to them. I'd heard he'd made a real name for himself with his MBA, PhD, real estate investments, world travel, master of divinity, political success, fill in the blank. And he's turned Catholic, Methodist, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Presbyterian, as the case may be, Baptist, Pentecostal, non-denominational megachurch. It doesn't matter. The point is it's different. Therefore, it's bad. He acts like he's not from around here, like he's not one of us. And what is he talking about? What could he know about anything? Who does he think he is? Or look at her, walking in here like she owns the place, wearing that outfit and those shoes, and you just see what she drove up in. I'd heard she'd made a real name for herself with her MBA, PhD, real estate investments, world travel, master of divinity, political success, slash fill in the blank. It's different, therefore it's bad. She acts like she's not from around here, like she's not one of us anymore. And what is she talking about? What could she know about anything? Who does she think she is? It happens. Men and women who've known one another for a long time can offend one another by moving away, daring to change, and then coming home again, especially by opening their mouths. Or on Facebook. Don't we know? Kids can do it too. Just let one summer pass. Kids can be like shapeshifters in Star Trek, especially around eighth grade. Child at the start of summer, young adult at the end of summer, young adult in the morning, kid in the afternoon, baby at evening, world expert at night, and mom and dad say it's like she's not one of us. What is he talking about? What could she know about anything? Who does she think she is? This Bible story about Jesus offending people in his hometown Makes me think of Danny Sharp, not his real name because the internet has ears. When Danny and I were in about the seventh or eighth grade, Danny, who did not attend my church, asked to speak to the church. Somebody let him know when the next Sunday night testimony time was, and he came. It was the big Baptist church in a small, mostly Baptist town. Not rich. Nobody I knew growing up was rich, although some people had more wealth than others. Wealth was different then and there. My dad made so little farming in 1969 that I was qualified for the first head start in uh, the summer of 1970. But we were on a farm. We grew and raised all the food we could eat and then some. Vegetables, fruit, beef, lots of beef. We had a car, two pickups, 
a big truck for hauling grain, two tractors and a combine and all this equipment and some land, Dad had some land. Cash came in, but it went right back out. We were rich in food and life, but cash poor enough for me to get into Head Start. I met Danny in Head Start, but he was poor, real poor, town poor, small town poor, not well-fed farm poor. So Danny, age 14 or so, stood up in the pulpit on a Sunday night to testify. The church was full of people more like me than him. If poor, then still well-fed because they were farm people or otherwise basically middle-class people. Danny shared his angry heart. He lowered the boom on us all for being full of ourselves, for not doing enough, if anything, for the poor in our town like him. Nobody knew what set him off. Maybe the Lord sent him. It was painful to hear and so awkward. I remember, my, I remember my face getting so hot. He was offending me and probably the rest of us. Not because of what he was saying, which was bad enough, but because of who he was and who he wasn't. He was a poor kid from a poor family, one of a bunch of kids. We knew who his folks were and he wasn't even a member of the church. And he came in and called us out. I think he had a vision for himself and his family and for us that was greater than our own vision for them or ourselves. I don't remember, actually, I was a kid, so I don't know whether we deserved the tongue lashing. I don't remember how the church as a church reacted or changed in response. I do remember my hot ears, my embarrassment, and the awakening of my conscience. Maybe others who were there remembered too. And maybe that's reason enough for him to have come that night. Maybe that's why he was sent. This kind of encounter is not uncommon. Someone leaves a place and comes back full of dreams and aspirations, opens their mouth and offends everyone either with the truth or their experience of the truth. Or like Danny, a neighbor so close he can come in just once and speak truth so raw. It makes people so uncomfortable that their ears turn red. And I think that's why this story about Jesus upsetting people in his hometown of Nazareth is in the Bible. Not because it was unusual, but for the opposite. Somebody is always thinking somebody else has gotten above their raisin. You can't go home again. Not because home has changed so much, but because you have. Sometimes it seems like home hadn't changed at all. Right out of high school, I worked in local radio in Van Buren and Fort Smith in Arkansas and in Salisaw, Oklahoma. I was, uh, from the time I was 18 to about 21 or 22. It was fun, and it got lots of attention in my small hometown. Once quite a while after, I'd gone back home to see my folks, and I'd stopped for gas in town before heading back to Texas. I'd lived in Texas for seven years or so, working at the paper in Wichita Falls, so it was about a dozen years after I'd done any radio. I had done lots of things since then, mainly gone to college. Well, when I went to, into the store to pay for my gas, the gal at the register, who I had also known since Head Start, said, Hey, Ricky, you still working at that radio station in Salisaw? Uh, no. Cracked me up. You can't go home again. And usually because you've changed, not because home has. Jesus went home, and he had changed. He taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son that we know? Is not his mother called Mary? Where did he get all this? Matthew doesn't say what Jesus taught that riled up his home folks. But chapter 13, so far, is nothing but parables. So let's just imagine that he taught one or some of those parables, and something offended them. It's not hard to upset people with parables either because they gain a new understanding that upsets some preconceived notion, or they just don't understand them at all. And that can be embarrassing. And embarrassed people get mad. Maybe in the synagogue that day, Jesus told the parable of the sower, with some seeds falling on the path, and the birds got them, and some seeds falling on the rocky ground, and the sun did them in for lack of roots. Some fell among the thorns, and the thorns choked them out, right? And some fell on good soil and they yielded an incredible crop. 
being used to hearing rabbis teach the people would have been pretty quick on the uptake with allegories. And the folks who saw themselves as good soil felt smug and comfortable, and they squinted at the ones they thought were rocky and thorny. You see that. But the ones who actually were good didn't. They didn't judge because they did have ears to hear Jesus. And humility, not pride, is the thing with Jesus. Let's say the ones who thought they were good soil are the ones mocking Jesus in this passage because he showed them that they weren't and they took offense at him. Maybe in the synagogue that day, Jesus told the parable of the weeds and the wheat. There are weeds in with the wheat, evil sown in with good everywhere in the world, and including the church. And that's great because we can try to figure out who's who, right? Who's in and who's out, who's real and who's faking it. But then something Jesus says makes them realize there's good and bad in everyone and in every single person, and each of us is, and all of us are doomed absent God's mercy and grace. And that made him mad because that leaves no one to exclude. There's no one to feel superior to. God will harvest us all and sort us out. And they took offense at him. Maybe in the synagogue that day, Jesus told the parable of the mustard seed, and they thought he meant that they'd grow to be as big as a tree, allegorically speaking, since being people of God, they would presume to be the vanguard of the kingdom of God. But then when they thought about what a pest mustard was, they realized Jesus meant the kingdom of God was something that got in people's way, not something that people looked up to. And they took offense at him. Or maybe it was the parable of the leaven, and they took offense at him on general principle because everyone knew that yeast was bad, and the kingdom of heaven couldn't possibly be bad. And besides, there was a woman in the story hiding the stuff. And they took offense at him. Maybe in the synagogue that day, Jesus told the parable of the treasure hidden in the field and the parable of the precious pearl. That's nice, they thought at first. Yes, the kingdom of heaven is a treasure that gives joy. It's worth sacrificing everything else to be able to get. But then they realized the man who found the treasure had no right to it, and he did wrong. How is that like the kingdom of heaven, they may have wondered, not seeing that the kingdom is like the treasure itself not who does what with it. Therefore, the story wasn't about them, and they took offense at him. The kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price, so beautiful, so rare, it's worth selling everything, sacrificing everything for, they thought, until they realized that hoarding the pearl made it worthless. So maybe they thought Jesus, that radical, was saying the kingdom was worthless, which meant they were worthless, because like some folks today, they misheard Jesus, he didn't say the kingdom of heaven was like the pearl. He said the kingdom was like a merchant on a search for a pearl who finds what he's looking for and then does what he always did, and he was short-sighted. So he either starved or he figured it out. And that does not sound like heaven at all. That sounds like a lot of thinking and reflection and praying and spiritual work. And they took offense at him. Or maybe in the synagogue that day, Jesus told the parable of the net, which sounds good, especially to folks who are always wanting to keep good people in and bad people out, insiders and outsiders, and they never imagined that they could be with a fish thrown back, which is offensive enough, but what he said was the bad fish would be thrown into fire. And besides that, this is the kingdom of heaven you're talking about, Jesus, which has to be super special. And there's nothing special about fishing, mister. We do it all day, every day. And they took offense at him. It could have been any of that. He just stepped on their toes. This local boy went away and came back with all this learning and wisdom and embarrassed them. Just who do you think you are, Jesus? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They took offense at him. I read something the other day, though, that gave a different take on this passage. And it makes so much sense to me in this time. I may never see this passage the same old way again. And as I say that, I see a twinkle in Jesus, the teacher's eye, because I am convinced that thinking is what he was after with his teachings. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, Jesus said. 
in the synagogue that day, maybe they weren't offended because Jesus was more than they expected, but because he was less. Maybe it was more than mere offense. Maybe it was real contempt. They expected a Messiah with a military escort, a revolutionary with power to overthrow Rome and usher in a political kingdom of God. And Jesus showed up telling weird little stories, trying to get people to think, to see the kingdom of God already in them and among them. As John D. Roars, an Episcopal rector, put it, Standing before them is not simply a presumptuous prophet returning to his hometown. He is the Messiah, but, and this is critical, not at all the Messiah they expect. The Messiah was to be a great leader and king, a man surrounded by the military and political power needed to return the people of Israel to prominence among the nations. Jesus thoroughly betrays this expectation. He instead claims the mantle of the suffering servant a far different model for messianic leadership. They took offense at him. Maybe they took offense at him because they wanted power, and all he was offering was grace and peace, salvation. Personal Jesus taught social justice, God's will done on earth among people, not selfish human will on earth, especially not done under the guise of the kingdom of his Father, Abba, in heaven. And doesn't that sound familiar? Here we go again. It's not a new thing, but it sure is in sharper focus now than it's been in my lifetime. The churches in this country, too many of the churches and church people, are all about power. They take offense at Jesus. This week, the New York Times recalled... In January 2016, Donald J. Trump gave a campaign speech at a small Christian college in Sioux Center, Iowa. Standing in front of a three-story pipe organ, he said, I have the most loyal people. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? But he said something else that day, and his intended audience heard him. He said, Christianity will have power. The story goes on, convincingly, to show that that's the thing. That's the thing that had 81% of evangelicals and a little more than half of mainline Christians voting the way they did, throwing away their reputation, and about any shred of integrity anyone outside the church still saw in them. It's not the spiritual crime. It's the hypocritical cover-up. They take offense at Jesus of Nazareth at self-denying Jesus, the teacher, who gave up power to live and to die on the cross. They wanted power. They got it. They traded faith for it. At what cost? At what cost to all of us remains to be seen. And he did not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. Amen. Amen.